The first reading is from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 5. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as the church is the head, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the saviour. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. Who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one can ever hate their own body, for they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. This is the word of the Lord. If you're able, would you please stand for the gospel? Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Mark 10, beginning at verse 2. Some Pharisees came and tested him by asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What does Moses command you, he said. They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote this law, Jesus replied. But at the beginning of creation, God made male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. When they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. He answered, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. Let us pray. Father God, we pray that you will meet us in your word this morning by your spirit, for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you please sit down? Well, what a text, huh? <laughs> We're going to do a bit of Blue Peter first. I've got two pieces of corrugated cardboard and I'm going to glue them together. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. I think it's fair to say Mark 10, 1 to 12, is a tricky passage. It's one of those ones that makes us count our buttons and shuffle our feet and wish we were somewhere else. But this passage begins at the beginning of chapter 10. And there he left them there and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan. The crowds gathered to him again. And again, as was his custom, Jesus taught them. 
so once again, Jesus is on the move and the crowds are coming with him. Among the crowds, we know there are some Pharisees and they want to see what's going on. They want to hear what Jesus is going to say. The crowds are really large. They want to make sure that they know what is said. And once again, they are baiting Jesus. They're asking questions which are designed to catch him out. Mark tells us that they are testing Jesus. He also gives one answer to the Pharisees and waits to explain further once the disciples are safely behind closed doors. We saw this in the parable of the sower. Do you remember in chapter 4, a few weeks ago, Jesus talks to the large crowd and teaches them in a parable. He uses the image of farmers and seeds and soils, and the people listen to what the story is. But it's not until the disciples have gathered together with Jesus later that he unpacks it a bit and helps us as well to understand what that passage means, what the soils mean, who the farmer is, what that seed is. And this two-part explanation here to this question is a similar situation. Jesus has one story for the, the big crowd and the question that he, he answers with the Pharisees, but the further explanation comes later when the disciples are on their own. We know from our previous studies of Mark's gospel that he doesn't waste his words. If it's included in the text, then it is important. Mark sets this scene very carefully. The previous passage was in Capernaum, but we know now that they have traveled to the re region of Judea and across the Jordan. So the first question this morning is, who do we know who lived and worked in the deserts around Jordan? The answer is John the Baptist. A few chapters before, Herod Antipas has put John the Baptist into prison because he said that it was unlawful for the king to be married to his brother's wife. John lost his head for speaking the truth to power. There is a reason that Jesus is saying these things in this place at this time. We know from the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus Jesus's standards are higher than the law. He says he's not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. We're not just to avoid murdering our neighbor. We're not even allowed to be angry with them. Divorce was allowed under Jewish law, under certain circumstances, and it's set out in Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 to 4. The Pharisees quote Moses to Jesus. Remember, Moses was one of the two figures to appear with Jesus on the mountain during trans the transfiguration that Johnny spoke of two weeks ago. The commandments that um, Moses brought down from the mountain do not forbid divorce, but it allows it under certain circumstances in order to protect the weaker party. Thou shalt not commit adultery is one of those ten commandments. That very law written on tablets of stone that Moses brought down from Mount Sinai. Do you remember that Cole Porter song? I'm not going to sing, don't worry. Anything goes. In olden days, a glimpse of stocking was looked on as something shocking. But today, heaven knows, anything goes. That's what it feels like, doesn't it? In olden days, oh, we couldn't do this, but now, goodness me. Jesus seems to be so clear about marriage and divorce, yet his view appears to be so far removed from our own society today. In his answer to the Pharisees, Jesus takes us all back to Genesis, to the very beginning. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Genesis 2, verse 24. The church takes divorce very seriously. I need to declare an interest here. I am married to a divorcee. And before I was allowed to begin my training for ordination, training, bear, bear that in mind, the church sent a member of the clergy, a bishop's advisor to our house, 
and he interviewed my husband, Ian, um, as to the reason for his first marriage breaking down. God was calling me to be a leader in this church, not Ian, but nevertheless, the process was very thorough. We'd been married for nearly 27 years now, and he'd been divorced for 10 years before I met and married him. But the church needed to hear this story to be sure. He had to ask two old friends to provide a reference for him. One to give um, a comment about his first marriage and what that was like. And another to give a comment on our marriage. At times this process was painful and it brought up a period in his life that he was very keen to move on from. And all this because I had a strong sense that God was calling me to be a leader in the church. Once the bishop's advisor had completed his report, we were asked to go and see Bishop Christopher, who was the previous bishop of Guildford. I was so nervous, can I just say. My husband is not a regular churchgoer. He only seems to come to church when I'm being ordained or my children are being confirmed, so that's all done now. I was so nervous, so we dressed as if we were going for an interview and we're driving down to Guildford. And I'm praying all the way, Lord, just give these two men something to talk about that will be okay. So we get to the lovely bishop's house and he welcomes us into his study and we sit in two chairs. And Bishop um, Christopher is a wise and kind man who's got many years of experience in ministry. So they read through the report and they decide that actually Ian's marriage to me is the one that is faithful and loving and we'll all be okay. And then there's that pause. You know what it's like? There's that pause when you think, oh my gosh, this has all gone much more quickly and we've still got 10 minutes left. What do we talk about? So I was much less confident of silence in those days. So I said to Bishop Christopher, you're well known in the diocese. How on earth do you have time off? How do you have time away from the busyness of church life? And he said, well, my wife and I like to go walking. We like to go and go walking along the canal and we like National Trust properties. And he said, but recently I've had shingles. And suddenly from my left here, I hear Ian say, oh, you poor man. Oh, my gosh, how terrible. I've also had shingles. And suddenly we had a meeting of the shingles club. <laughs> and they were discussing um, how long their symptoms were, where they had shingles, which got very strange. And, um, you know, how they felt better and how they were uncomfortable. And, and suddenly I'm just trying not to laugh, thinking, Lord, you are so amazing. Even the horribleness of shingles has brought these two men together. So this shingles club now finished, and um, Bishop Christopher invited us into his chapel. And um, he prayed for us, he blessed our marriage, he prayed for my voca sense of vocation, and we all said the Lord's Prayer together. Oh my gosh, I was thinking, who could have get imagined the detail that God is involved in? But it didn't finish there. Once this meeting was over, a report was sent to the Archbishop of Canterbury. And in order for me to be ordained, he had to raise a faculty, which is like, you know, a churchy, legally thing, to allow me to be ordained in the church. So I want you to know that the church takes marriage and divorce very seriously. Jesus' words are at odds with our society. Because I think we have become hard-hearted. We are focused on the wrong things. And I think that leads us astray. You know the old adage, if the grass is greener on the other side of the fence? Well, I think if the grass is greener on the other side of the fence, then it's time to water your lawn. Pay some attention to the one that you are with. Dress up, dress, dra dress down, stay in, go out, whatever you do, but try and do it together. I think when the history books are written about this last season over the eight last 18 months and what's to come, we will look with some perspective at the effect of long periods of lockdown on relationships. For some, this last season has been the making of them. It has brought them together in a way they could never have imagined. But for others, it has been absolutely too much. And some have not been safe at home. And if that is the case, then they need to get out and they need to be safe. 
One third of all marriages end in divorce. My mum and dad have been married for 57 years, and if you ask my lovely mum what the secret of a long marriage is, she would say that it's 80% give on both sides. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife, and the two will become one flesh. No matter what the reason for the breakdown of a marriage, people get hurt. They don't leave intact. They're damaged by the experience. They are, their children, their friends, their parents, everybody's damaged by that. Jesus isn't trying to be difficult. He wants us to take marriage seriously. But the most important of all, he wants our relationship with him to be taken seriously. Because no matter how good your marriage or your single life or your friendships are, it is our relationship with God through his son, Jesus, by his Holy Spirit, that will really never let us down. It will never betray us. God loves us completely. He knows us completely better than anyone you've ever met. And he still loves us forever, no matter what. Amen.